My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Show of hands real quick. Uh, how many of you guys are familiar with the Cartoonist k YouTube channel? Oh, that's fresh, man. So you guys are definitely giving the marching orders to get us the heck out of here, man. <laughs> I don't think it was unanimous. So for those who don't know, for those who have come to this panel just because they have good taste and they dig the comics that Jim and I make, we have a YouTube channel where we talk comics, and it's fresh. You want to go there. Make sure you subscribe to that shit. Enough with that, man. Let's get to business, dude. All right. Well, welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe, everybody. And we talked Woo! about some... Uh, We prepared some, some content on the ride down here, and I thought we might start with the uh, top 10 Marvel inkers of the 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> when in Rome, right? Yeah, you know, that's the one thing I didn't see. Oh, shouts to Bill Boy Show. We did an interview with him not too long ago <laughs> uh, up on the channel. Um, where, the, where the heck was I going with that? Oh, yeah, like I was walking around on the floor, and usually, once a year, never fails, somebody reads in the paper or in like the, 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 the weekly circular in town that there's a Comic Con in town, and you might see a Deadpool or two walking around. But I didn't see one up there yet. <laughs> Not yet. There's always tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is a 25th anniversary of SPX. SPX, one of uh, probably the, the show I've done the most. My first time was 2000, so I don't have 25 years of experience here, but we've been coming here for a while, Ed. It's true, and uh, do you respect this little piece of real estate that we have here right at this very minute? Because they don't give just anybody you know, the microphone and, and just let them go up there and riff, man. Usually, I'm on a panel with like six motherfuckers. <laughs> 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 They're usually good people, but they stack that deck usually, man. The people who get those singular ones, like I may even get a singular one. Chris Ware will get a singular one. With a moderator, though. So it's always two people on the stage. Can you hear my knuckles crack? <laughs> <laughs> so I'd say we're on that level. Yeah, man. But always, a, always up here with like cool people. One of the questions I wanted to ask you, man, um, it was something I was reflecting upon myself, thinking about coming here since like 2004, um, the evolution, not only of the show, but just like of our own kind of careers, man. Like, what, what have you taken away from in these past however many years you've done it? Well, we were talking about Deadpool cos cosplayers. Um, if anybody was here in 2000 and saw me tabling, you might remember me wearing a um, bright yellow jumpsuit, long sleeves, very bright, looked like a banana or a rodeo clown, a lawn wrangler maybe. I don't think I've ever told this uh, story. Mark Paul, what's up, boy? I don't think I ever told this story on k man, but at Pittsburgh Comic Con, that was some attire that you rocked as well. Whenever you ask <laughs> comics, and this is before I knew you, and I was a real knucklehead little teenager. My homeboy had a video camera, one of those video cameras that was like a two-liter bottle of Pepsi. We put the big ass VHS tape, and we were walking around just being obnoxious. And we uh, the camera pans, and it comes on you and uh, Jason Lex, both in your matching yellow attire, and we we're like, who are these bananas in pajamas? On the <laughs> Do you still have that footage? The tape is around. He has it somewhere. He promises he has. He's never gotten rid of a VHS. Since I met you, I've been trying to like, bust that thing out. <laughs> because I actually like, saw it like one or two times when I first met you, and I'm like, oh my goodness, it's, like, I hang out with that guy. <laughs> so that's, that's, uh, that, that's one of my pieces of evolution as a cartoonist. I've actually shed the jumpsuits. But it is important to try to get noticed, I think, at these. It's a very competitive scene up there on the floor, so got to stand out somehow. It's amazing how the show has grown, too. You know, in the old building, it was in like three disparate uh, uh, ballroom locations, I guess. Like, there was like, there would be like- Low ceilings. Room. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, uh, just thinking about those early days, it's like having Xeroxed stuff, and I had no idea about how to even make a zine or anything, so I made the mistake of using the top loader uh, at, um, on the Xerox machine, so all of my zines were like a little bit wobbly, and the imagery would get distorted, kind of like that when Jim Lee draws void. <laughs> you all know, right? <laughs> but there would be that weird like little distortion, man, and, and then, uh, it was probably you guys who dropped the science and were like, that, dude, you don't use that, man. You don't use the top loader. You could, you could scan one side and then scan the other and spit it out. Like, that's what this festival represents to me, man, uh, in the, the true kind of sense of the word convention when it comes to other professional um, professions. Like, I, this is information gathering to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we joke around a little bit about some of those, those early shows 
But this, this show was revolutionary because like, it was the second comic book show I had ever done. And at the time, there was a real divide between um, alternative or indie comics and like mainstream, which is you know, Marvel DC at that time. And so whenever this show pops up, my taste had kind of drifted away from that Marvel DC model. And I was just kind of moving away from comics. And I found some of the alternative comics, and that's what kept my interest in this, and, and you know, m continued on the path of making my own comics. And so whenever I actually got to this show for the first time, man, it was like the Holy Lands or something. I had never seen anything like this in my life. And that was a difference then. You know, I, I think that one thing this show has done, one thing comics have kind of evolved over you know, the, the course of this show's history, is that we don't have those divides as much anymore, or maybe we have I don't know, 50 different kinds of comics now, so those divides aren't as great. You're not either Marvel DC or Fanagraphics. You know, now there's stuff in between and on either side of those. But that's been a major, major difference. And I think if you're of a certain age, you may not remember that part, but, but it's almost like there have been fights and battles in the history of comics to legitimize comics. Uh, the very first show I did here, I can remember this, this woman coming around and stopping at every single table and looking at everything very earnestly. And I'm looking at her, and she did not look like the, the people that I was seeing at like the Comic-Con I had attended before this. And I'm like, what's your interest in comics? Tell me about you, you know, where, where are you coming from? She was a librarian looking for comics for her library, and it was just like mind-blowing. Because as a kid, there were no comics in my library. And so I'm a little bit jealous of like this next generation that gets that. But it showed, like this show was a huge force, I think, in that evolution. Because after this show started, you started to see these alternative shows springing up. You know, I remember like Space and Columbus was an early one for me. It probably started a couple years after this. Mocha in New York, and now there are virtually every city of any size has some version of this like small press, zine, independent media shows. And I think SPX was one of the big kind of the lighthouses that really started that movement. This is one of the shows that's nearest to my heart. I use it in a very kind of personally important fashion when it comes to um, just, just gauging my own trajectory. This is like a control for me each year. Uh, we talk about Heroes Con in North Carolina often, and that's the convention because we have to drive so far. It's like an eight hour drive to and fro. That's where we end up planning the year's activities in terms of like the comics we're making or any kind of strategies we employ. Conquering the comics industry. You know, I was, I was being humble for this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this, festival to me is like, let me see, see where I'm at now. Um, if there's a lateral movement, or if there's just the same amount of people that come up to the table as last year, I better restructure a couple things, man, because I'm in it to win it, you know what I mean? I'm not trying to just tread water in this game. And that's what uh, SPX has always been for me, just like a little control mechanism, man. And the other thing that's cool, you know, on the channel we have all kinds of wrestling nomenclature being batted around and in. I liberally, liberally use that term jobber. And the thing that I like about this festival is there's not one person that I can point to who has impure motivations um, of like what I consider to be like the jobber mentality. Everybody here who makes the comics and who has a table is enthusiastic about the medium and is making comics because they love them. And that's an infectious energy that recharges my batteries in a major way, like mainline fashion. You know, when we get out of here this weekend, the second I get home, we're going to get home Monday at probably 6 p.m. By 7 p.m., after I put my clothes in the wash, man, I'm getting back to making comics. You know? Yeah, it's, uh, I, I'm with you 100% on that, Ed. The, the recharging is definitely a real thing. I would go uh, even one step further, you know, besides measuring from year to year the progression, this is also the place where I go and find a lot of inspiration. Definitely. Production, design, stories, everything. You know, it's, it's so different than almost any other show I go to in terms of the density. It's just a loaded show. How many people are here? Is this their first SPX? Oh, that's awesome. Man, I'm like that's envious of all of you. I hope you all have a great, great weekend. But one thing that it made me think about, and I don't think we've talked about this on the show before, is randomness. When I was a little kid, everything was random. I didn't have an internet. I didn't know what was coming out. I, I didn't even have Wizard Magazine when I started reading comics, yeah. if you can imagine those dark ages. You do live in the age of like, targeted marketing. Absolutely. You, know, you look at a book on Amazon, you, look, you watch something on Netflix, and pretty soon you have a queue of recommendations that sort of line up perfectly. I like the random, and you don't get it very often. It reminds me of when I was a kid in video stores, and it would just be walls of stuff that looked amazing, and they were all pulling my attention, and I had never heard of any of them. And how important was 
knows that. You know, like you develop taste that way by just happening upon different things and you can judge for yourself, do I like this or do I not? You don't need an algorithm to tell you if, you're, if it's your thing or not. Well, I probably could have used it in the video store. <laughs> there were a lot of misses in my rental history. Tom, Tom Savini's Jack the Ripper. That, that's, that's the one that I remember. But this is the show for that random kind of approach. So I encourage all of you, whether you've been here you know, 25 years, anybody, anybody been here to every show, every SPX? You should get like a prize See, if that were true. That's how things change, man. I was a young buck when I came here. Now I'm, I'm like the oldest dude in the room. Well, whether you're new to this show or not, I'd encourage you to, to you know, seek out a few of these books that you've never heard of and, and really kind of investigate and give yourself a little, a little bit of time to just explore and whatever catches your eye, kind of dive down that rabbit hole a little bit. Um, every year I go home with stuff from cartoonists I've never heard of who then I'm seeking out more of their work, following them, wanting more. So that's one of the real virtues of this show for me. Yeah, for, the, for those of you who are sort of newish to, to the, the, the show, I mean, SPX and haven't been here that much, and if you're a, and if you're a maker, one of the biggest pieces of advice that I can give is to um, not go home with any of your comics. Like, if you're here selling stuff, you have to, like, trade every single issue of whatever it is you have, no matter what. Uh, you'll get some cool stuff in return, and you've just made a friend. Next year, you come back, you're going to have more people at the table, and then you're going to have people that you know who built into the show. And it just grows like that. Like, I remember 2004, my first show, I felt real left out because everybody kind of knew everybody. That's the way I felt. And there were like all these like little clicks and everything. And I'm like, man, this, is, this feels uninviting. And it's just not that way. The, the thing about comics is that everybody is basically socially inept because all they do is sit around drawing. So nobody knows how to, how to bring you into the fold. Uh, they're as awkward as you are, man. And uh, you know, we're all brothers and sisters through comics, you know, so, so like. That's just how it works. You know, we all went through that stage where we came here, didn't know anybody, traded a couple comics, and then your first Google hits come within a week or two because somebody like talks about it on their blog or something. Do they even have blogs anymore? They did back then. They had no Facebook. I remember thinking that Facebook, and uh, MySpace actually, was created for us in a way because you would come here, you would meet people. And you would have to just like save up all the conversational topics that you would want to discuss with them for the next year. <laughs> wow. You know what I'm saying? You have such a better memory than me. <laughs> and then uh, when, faith, when MySpace came up and everybody started getting those in the game here, it was really cool because it was, at first it was like Instagram is now. Like I like Instagram because I want to go to your, to your page and just see cool images. I don't care about any of your other bullshit. I don't want to hear about your day even. I just want to see cool drawings. Um, and Facebook, uh, MySpace was like that for a minute. And then, you know, Facebook happens. It, it created this ability to kind of like be closer in contact with the people that you meet here and, and become friends with and who you only see once per year. So that was like a cool addition. I really do feel like it crept up to service a need that we specifically had, but that's just because I'm selfish and uh, make everything about me. Yeah, I'm sure everybody uses those a little differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the early days, I, you know, before social media, you would come back from this event, and I was on like the Comics Journal message boards, and everybody would post like their photo of what they got or their list of what they would get, and it would be so much envy, like I would miss everything. And then it would be good luck trying to track this down. People weren't selling this stuff on their own websites. They might not have even had their own websites. And it was always so frustrating. So sometimes now you get to learn about that stuff ahead of the show and track right. it down <laughs> if you're smart. Yeah, that first show, the, the book to grab, you had to be in the know, was um, that Wolverine, Kitty Pride versus the Zombies bootleg comic that Jeffrey Brown did. Maybe 200 copies of that baby were floating around. And that was awesome. Then now I'm thinking about checking out the panels, and I went to the Fantagraphics panel, and it was the first time I saw uh, Gary Groth and Kim Thompson in, in real life, because I've seen drawn versions of them for as long as I can remember, you know, Peter Bag versions and, and Dan Klaus versions of them, and of course those caricatures were, were far distorted, but the second I saw them, I remember thinking like, wow, Peter Bag really captured Gary's posture. <laughs> Prisoners of Hate Island, hate number one, so make sure you check that out. But the cool thing about that panel, now that I think about it, was they were promoting volume one of Peanuts. Like, it was either fresh out or was about to just come out. Um, the other book that they were promoting that was supposed to come out around then was
was the oral history book, We Told You So, uh, or whatever it's called, um, The Oral History of Fantagraphics, and it was a book I was stoked for. I think the, the cover was even finished back then, um, and the book just isn't coming out, isn't coming out. A decade goes by, <laughs> which was very awesome and fortuitous for me, because then I got to be in the book, man. <laughs> very Image Comics-like, that, that late shipment. <laughs> Yeah, I'll tell Gary you said that. <laughs> See what he has to say. I'm sure he'll appreciate that one. I need to get those guys in front of the hot lights while we're here, man, and, and get, uh, get Gary to tell us everything he can remember about that Todd McFarlane interview he did. <laughs> <laughs> he'll probably be like, Todd, who? <laughs> yeah, de definitely do that. That's definitely on the short list. Um, you know, Ed, you, you started this by asking about ch changes, you know, as a cartoonist. And the, ch the big change that I think this show has had on me is the style idea. And, and, you know, when I grew up, it was sort of like certain publishers looked a certain way. You know, Spider-Man looked a certain way. The Hulk looked a certain way. Archie looked a certain way. And alternative comics looked a certain way. And coming to this show, like, I would see so many of these different styles. And it seemed like this was the first place that I started to realize, like, there was no one style. Like, you could draw comics with anything in any style. And that's probably one of the big takeaways over the years, you know, just accumulating mini comics, self-published stuff. That was something that really came out. And I feel like now that's the norm. Like, I don't know if there is, you know, if we all thought of what, what a comic looks like, I think we would all have a different picture in our head. And that's really evolved, I think, in the last decade and a half or so. One thing I did make note of, though, over these years, almost every year, and I haven't uh, walked around the floor enough to, to figure it out this year. <laughs> But there are trends. Uh -huh. There are trends that develop. Like you could go to enough tables in a day and see, like, kind of like where the zeitgeist is with certain aesthetics. Do you, do you, can you uh, remember any trends from yes. past years? So, like that first one, 2004. Uh, for whatever reason, I have no idea what was going on in the culture. But many cartoonists, and in fact, the it might have been the last SPX anthology volume uh, the book that, that came out, the Brian Ralph edited one, even that the cover displays it. And it was um, kind of like Inky and Blinky, the, the Pac-Man ghosts. That like invaded indie comics like that year. And there were like a dozen people who had comics that had these weird ghosts on them. And then it runs the gamut, usually spearheaded nowadays by, um, by internet memes and junk. So there was like the pizza year, and maybe the pizza thing has like even carried over a little bit. Like like they didn't get the memo that that was so 2013 or something. <laughs> but uh, we'll see we'll see what it is this year. And for me, it's like if they're all going that way, go this way. You know what I'm saying? Like let them all do their thing, man. I'm gonna go this way and, and see how that works out. I want to do some pizza stuff with Street Angel. I need that trend to like phase out. There was the cat trend. <laughs> That thing doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. Well, I hope not. Cats are much more than a trend. <laughs> I, I actually am suspicious of cartoonists that don't have a cat, and I'm suspicious Ed. Of cartoonists who don't wear glasses, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> we need to do something about that. You need to get a couple more hours a day under your belt. And, I don't, and your wrist has to hurt, too. <laughs> I may just need to visit the optometrist. <laughs> You are driving us back home, man, so hopefully that's a joke that you just made. <laughs> we made it here safely. No, it's true. It's true. I'm very, very uh, happy about that. And I've been asking people, I was signing books this morning, and I was asking people if they had any questions for us for this, uh, you know, for, for this panel. And one of them was, uh, any advice you'd have for your 15-year-old self? Ooh, that's a good question. Like, does anything come to your mind? I would like to think about it for two seconds if I can. You know, I've done a lot of stuff besides comics, and maybe if I had to do it over again, I'd concentrate on comics more. But I, I like drawing, so I also don't regret some of my <laughs> tangents into other areas. Yeah, I think that um, a festival like this is a really great starting point. I wish I would have come here maybe a little bit earlier. I'm a, I forget if Dash Shaw is older or younger than me. I think if he's younger, it's by a little bit. But... Um, I am envious of anybody who was like younger than me, especially when I started out coming to this festival, because it does kind of, um, it shows you the landscape a little bit better than uh, if you were just doing this stuff on your own. But you start making the Xerox thing, maybe you graduate to doing like print on demand, and then if you choose, you can solicit the help of a publisher to, to put your work out there. 
Uh, that could be an end goal or not. It could be just looked at as a mutually beneficial business experience. And I, early on, got into some deals that were not advantageous. Like, I would, I'll say I was taken advantage of. And that comes from not having somebody in my corner to look over contracts. So I would um, tell, like, my younger self to just, like, have somebody. Don't think that you know what the heck you're doing. Um, we, we do live in a letter of the law kind of uh, kind of system. So a few words can really like screw the whole thing up. And uh, there has been attrition in my circle uh, since 2003 or 2004. And a lot of it has to do with bad, being taken advantage of and having you just fully take the wind out of one's sails to the point that they don't even try to make comics anymore, you know what I'm saying? So I think you just gotta, if you're in it the way that I am, as like, this is my living, but it's very important to me, like I kinda need to make comics all the time, so I have to get all those ducks in a row, and I would recommend anybody um, take those steps, even if you know you have to cut off like 10% to, to whoever's looking at the contract, whatever, it's worth it. It's totally worth it just so that you get, uh, you just don't get taken advantage of. And there's, even in a game like this, where it's low stakes, there's still scumbags out there. You know? There's, <laughs> there's a lot of scumbags out there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, here. Yeah, that's what I mean in comics. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if the low stakes invites them or something. It, it may be uh, attractive to them. Ed, did you find some of, uh, you know, like some of the resources, I don't know if that's networking, if it's people that you trust or whatever, through shows like this? Yeah, the, if you get to know somebody and you just have conversations, you go to dinner or whatever, like the real business happens after the show. Like this is commerce right now. The commerce is happening. Mm -hmm. That's less interesting to, to me. Um, for the long term, when I was younger, the money that I would make here helped keep the lights on. You know, like that was a big part of my thing. Um, that's less important now. Like, the books are out there, they're selling. So the real business now is just in putting uh, mental energy together, uh, having these conversations afterward. You go off, have your conversations. I go off, have my conversations. We have to spend that ride home together, man, and it's that debriefing session to just try to figure, figure this thing out. I wonder if everybody approaches these shows this way. I don't know. Because, <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like, uh, you know, anytime I do some sort of an art event, I always think, like, the, the number one piece there is the people, mm -hmm. um, good or bad, you know, whether it works or not. And the shows have just been an extension of that. I mean, certainly, if I think of art events that I do, it's more of these comic book shows than anything else. Yeah. And, and it's exactly what you say. Um, you know, it's the friendships that you make uh, through these things. And if, you know, I didn't go to school for comics or anything, so like whenever I started coming to this, it was important that I find other cartoonists that I could actually get to read my comics. Um, I know I've said it on the show before, the very first SPX I ever attended, I literally could not give away my comics. It's funny because you, as the channel grows, we're gonna be able to zero in on the name of this motherfucker <laughs> that back because it started out. Oh man, a if somebody has, has a map from this so early now, show. So now it's tightened, and now it's SPX 2002, 2003. Mm, yeah, keep thinking that direction. That's good. <laughs> Throw you That's slightly awesome. off We're the scent. We're going to find this guy. Oh man, I'm going to have to stop talking about it. But <laughs> the, the fun trick to play is take those comics that maybe don't look like something that would really appeal to you, but somebody's offering them. Go ahead and take them politely, and then what you do is... Um, when your neighbor next to you is, is engaged with somebody, you slip those comics into their box. And that'll be something that they get to open whenever they get home. It's very fun, everybody wins. <laughs> and then you don't have somebody tracking you down for giving that comic back. The, there will be printing trends over, over the past 15 years. And print Gakko was the exciting new kind of print technology. Yeah, I'll describe I, that real fast. I don't even think it was new. It was, it, I don't think it was new. I think it was a, a Japanese novelty little screen print press. And so like mini comic cartoonists would adopt it because it was relatively easy and quick to use. Imagine screen printing, but just with a small device. And I think there was just a light bulb that you yeah. kind of flick on and off to expose your screen. Kind of like um, a little bit more cumbersome risograph. Yeah, or a less messy 
silk screens gimmick. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and I, I was at these shows. I think somebody used to actually print them here at their table, like that was part of their gimmick. Instead of wearing a yellow jumpsuit, they would actually be printing fresh covers uh, right at their table. I remember that trend. That was probably 05. And it went away fast. It was, a, it was a supernova of a trend because everybody really <laughs> started doing it. And then they bought up all the rest of the material. Like they weren't making more of that stuff. Right. I think that's why it went away. And so it was like bought up by everybody who attends SPX. And then the next year it was like, we need to figure something else out. <laughs> and then that's when like Rizograph and uh, stuff like that starts to come in vogue. Yeah, the Rizograph, I feel like that's been the trend for 10 years. Sure. Yeah. Like, Frick Aqua was a while ago. Yeah. I like the Rizograph, though. Speaking of the trends, you know, like you find a lot of stuff. So one year I found this comic called Galactic Beatdown uh, by Keenan Marshall Keller, a, a cartoonist based in LA. He wasn't here. Like somebody, you know, like sometimes people will just kind of like put their books all together, and then whenever they're going to a show, they take some of their friends, and whenever their friend's going to a different show, they take some of theirs. So I found this comic, but no Keenan, just the comic. Yeah. And it was like plastic almost. It was the brightest color. It was a sci-fi, like dumb fight comic, which is one of my favorite kinds of comics. But it was printed um, by a company that prints menus. So, you know, like I had to track Keenan down, you know, Monday night whenever I got home, I'm like, I need to know how to make this. So uh, I contacted him, very impressed by it. And then I contact all my friends and I'm like, do you guys know this comic? And they pointed me to Jason Carnes' fuck a tour. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I, I showed Ben Mara Galactic Beatdown, and that was his response. It was like, well, have you seen this guy? And the reason I mentioned that, we're talking about production techniques. If you've ever seen any of his comics, he would produce them. I also ha I ordered those, and then I had to track down, like, how does he do this? They look like real newsprint, like 1970s comics. And if you know, uh, like, aphrodisiac, like, I've been interested in those old production techniques. So then I got in touch with Jason Carnes, and he was printing them on the cheapest inkjet printer. I had, I think, two of those printers sitting on my shelves collecting dust, and it never occurred to me that you could make art out of those yeah. <laughs> until I saw his, you know, his, his mini comics. And so that became something that I would make zines with for several years afterwards. But it is just like you find this stuff that looks a little bit different just from a production standpoint. And this has become like my R&D space totally. for that reason. S SPX works that way. It makes you respect kind of all the weird stuff that kind of gets sloughed off in terms of what the industry considers to be professional. It's like, nah, man, you can make something cool on an inkjet printer. And those comics that he made, they, they really have a tactility to them. They feel like they existed for far longer than they did. It creates all this interesting aesthetic stuff that is impossible to do on like a professional yeah. Quote unquote level. They don't just look dirty, they feel dirty when you touch them. Yeah. It's the whole experience. Yeah, if you guys ever pop into our live stream inking sessions where like lately Jim, is, Jim and I have been um, starting new comics and we'll just do these, um, I call them flash mob live streams. Um, whenever it's penciling time, I don't know about you, Jimmy, I need to just be alone. I need to take my time, I need to be, I need perfect quiet to just compose my pages. But when it's ink time, I can do that in a company of friends, and I'll bust out the live stream. Uh, and Carnes, Keenan Marshall Keller, uh, Ben Mara, like they just manifest. Mark Palm just pops into the damn chat, and it becomes like this whole thing where there are makers, creators. There's a, there's a dude who pops into the chat who designs costumes for um, the WWE. That's about as cartoonist cave as you can get. Yeah, that's pretty good. One of the costumes is like Wolverine. He like made a, a veiled Wolverine costume for some <laughs> WWE wrestler who probably has no idea. Yeah. By the way, those three cartoonists, all of them I found through SPX. Oh, that's cool. So, good list. Yeah, that's cool, man. Like, I, I remember when I first met Ben Mera, and I was almost disappointed because of the Ben Mera that I saw on the page, and like his About the Author page, if you guys are familiar with his work, one of the most fun pieces of the comics, which are fun too, don't get me wrong, but his like about the author page on the inside cover will always be like a picture of him, you know, with no shirt on, with like, with like a bathrobe staring out of a, a window with mood lighting, and there might be like a naked woman in the reflection of his aviator sunglasses. <laughs> and, remember, and, and then you look at the comics. Yeah, and, and like, always a very fun biography below the picture to go along with it. Yeah, yeah, and it's very, always very vapid and like, yeah, because like, like, you know, the comics are the future, man. And like, it'll say stuff like that. But then you meet the guy and it's like super awesome, sweet, charitable dude. But I've yet to meet or 
meet anybody who had been, who was like in the same place as Jason Carnes. And when he pops up in that kayfabe chat, I always tell him like, dude, it would be awesome to get an interview with you, but if we do, we'll have like some sort of like veil and just have his shadow and maybe even like distort his voice a little bit so we could keep that magic. You know what I mean? Because the comics look like they're made by a maniac. <laughs> and, and it would be great to kind of like, kind of like preserve that mystique. It might even be a good uh, subject for like a Skype interview. Just, you know, so we don't take any chances yeah, set up sure. in the same yeah, room. Yeah, yeah. I, I would like to sort of not meet him. Like if, 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 comics, <laughs> if comics was a far bigger sort of medium in terms of like big cartoons being able to keep their heads above water, then that would mean that you would never have to meet like a Ben Merritt. You could preserve that because he wouldn't have to come to festivals to like sell the book or whatever because it would just be out there and he would be all good. Um, but the fact that Carnes is like, I don't even care about going to festivals, that adds to the mystique, you know? Like, that's very rare. Did you want to get into any process? You were talking about penciling alone, and we have both started books recently, so it's been kind of, it's kind of nice that we're synced up schedule-wise so we can compare and contrast. Yeah, sure. And you talk about uh, you know, penciling in your, in your very focused, alone kind of way. My pencils are a mess. They're like a dozen pages. I'm yeah. light boxing things, I'm drawing on all kinds of scraps, and then doing like the final version is, is my nice, neat version for the inking part. But man, like doing like all the pencils on one board, I don't know what's going on. I feel like my, my uh, ability goes backwards in a way. I know what you mean. It, it takes longer than it used to take. I think the end result is much better, but man, the process doesn't get any easier. And I, I've been prepared for that by reading enough Comics Journal interviews. Uh, specifically, off the top of my head, I remember Kim Deitch, or Deitch, I always forget how to say the last name. I remember him saying exactly that. The more you know, the more you don't know. Yeah, that's a good way uh, to say it. Competence. You like you you conquer this small element that you've been focusing on for a little while, and then sometimes just through observation, you notice like some other things that maybe other artists do that's kind of cool that you could maybe want to start to incorporate, and then that takes some time, you know. And and that's what comics is. That's the reason I like doing it so much. Is this, this constant education, this constant evolution. Uh, I feel like. You know, I evolve as a person myself, just in the process of making the comics. Uh, we have the advantage of being in our space and having, at, like, we can listen to stuff constantly. So it's like I'm constantly taking in information and becoming a little bit more worldly, a little smarter while doing the work. And then that, just what's going on in the world kind of inflects upon the work. And, and, and I think that adds to the whole thing, man. But I'm sort of in the same boat where the thought part of the thing is just taking more and more time, uh, right. more and more consideration. There's, uh, in, in comedy, a lot of comedians have been talking like Seinfeld and uh, Chappelle, a bunch of guys, about this thing where, you know, they're known quantities, they're major celebrities, and they don't know if they're freaking funny anymore whenever they go out and perform because they're getting a lot of of uh, Marks. Ad adulation, yeah, just from name equity. Right. And you just don't want that, you know what I mean? Like, you, you want to keep growing, and you want to keep rocking. Um, it's awesome that people stick with me through the hall. There, I've seen people here today, I was barely on the floor, and people came up to me who I remember from SPX 2004. Um, it's so cool that they've stuck around with this stuff, but it's like, I just want to keep elevating the work. Yeah. And it takes time. Yeah, you, you know, you talk about thinking. I had kind of a, a fun breakthrough this week. I've been working on a, um, I've started, my new comic is about cross-country running, and I think another project's gonna kind of push that one aside, but I enjoy running, and so uh, one of the things that I've started doing this week is cross-country running season is set in the fall, Yeah. so right now, mm. and I've been keep, started keeping a journal about sort of the physical qualities of the environment that I run in this time of year for my future reference. So if I have to you know, postpone this for a couple of months and now I'm drawing it in, I don't know, January, I will still have reference to like what the temperature is, what the lighting looks like. Like I run at three, three o'clock, which would be like your after school practice time, or eight in the morning, which would be like your Saturday morning meet times, and then just record whatever comes up. Like I saw two dead snakes this week on runs. So. Yeah, the snakes will 
enter into the comic. They know? very well might. Yeah. But it's, it's having that kind of like, when you talk about like you're thinking about this stuff more, um, that's part of the process. It's almost like how, you know, what works, what makes sense, what can I draw from, and it's, that's not related to plot in any way, but it's going to make those pages much, much richer. It's going to make that world much richer. That's, so That's the word I was thinking, rich. Yeah. Because uh, the cartoonists that kind of get credit for that, it would be like a Eisner even, Eisner, Miller, uh, the seasons change in those comics. Um, Jillian Tamaki is good for that. And Jillian Tamaki is a cartoonist that I first, the first Jillian Tamaki book I ever saw, I picked up at SPX on recommendation of Dylan Williams. Mm -hmm. So Dylan Williams is the late publisher of Sparkplug Comics. I don't mean to derail your don't thread, don't but don't it was one of my notes is like things that I have found at SPX over the years. And I would always just ask everybody, you know, like what they have found, what they recommend, because if you're tabling, you just miss so much and that would always eat at me. And so uh, one year he recommended Jillian Tamaki's book Skim that was here. And uh, I don't know if she was even here that year, but her, that book was here and it was like quite an impression. And you're totally right. She's great at atmosphere, environment, all the stuff that's, it looks effortless when you're reading it. Right. And man, does it make that reading experience memorable. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it can't hurt to put lots of thought into the work. And I do think of it as method cartooning in a way. <laughs> that was one of the things, like I, I've used that term method cartooning uh, a lot in the past. You know, Which like, scares me if you've been watching his inking sessions. <laughs> Believe me, well, you should be worried about that. Well, you know what, what really scared me uh, with, with that terminology was when we did uh, the Tim Vigil shoot interview and he used that term a lot. He's like, I'm a method cartoonist. I'm like, really? What does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, but the way that I'm choosing to, to use that term and explore that term is, is I didn't happen upon the, the term splatterpunk not too long ago, and I never heard that term. Uh, so I just mentioned it on one of our weekly episodes, got a laundry list of recommendations of really cool paperbacks and junk, and I've just been scooping them all up, hitting them one at a time. Like, if you guys don't see me on the floor today, that means I'm up in the hotel room reading Rex Miller's Chain Gang, <laughs> where that, that has this pitch at the top. That's like he's 500 pounds of executing muscle, or no, it's like he's a 500 pound executioner. He's just get, getting out of jail and he wants some real food and then he wants a heart. <laughs> <laughs> Sold. Sold, man. I read about 30 pages of it, and even if it goes nowhere, the spirit in which it's written is a fun ride, and I don't mind, man. Like every page, there's something on there where I'm like, oh, that's so great. It's been one of the revelations of us doing this YouTube channel to me, is being able to talk about these things and then having you know, the, the viewers, the audience, chiming in and adding that kind of stuff has been amazing. So yeah. thank you all for that. Yeah, it's one of those things where I think one of the value, one of the benefits of just like who we are as, as cartoonists or as like presenters on that channel is um, in this day and age where basically every question that has an answer to it can, can be found on the internet, um, it's like real unhip, and people are real self-conscious about saying, I don't know, but not us. It's just like, well, I know a bunch, and, and let me just pan the camera around in my room, and there, you can't question my comics knowledge when you see like all the shit. You seem pretty occurred. committed to comics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but do I know everything? Do you know everything? No. And we present like, oh, I don't know, K favors, man, what you got for us, and then just what I don't think we've, we've put anything out that hasn't been answered. No, one, one of the most obscure questions, so like I, I carry a list around on my phone of stuff. I, I collect a lot of like 80s self-published black and white comics, which can be a little bit hard to find and a little bit obscure at times. Yeah. Sometimes they're regionally limited. There's a lot of reasons why you can't find these. Some of them were thrown out, I think. Um, so there was one I was carrying around for a while called Viet Ninja. Mm -hmm. That's a Jim Rope title if I've ever heard one. Well, it certain, certainly made my list. Yeah. And I would always look for that anytime I would come across these kind of 80s uh, small press books, and I just couldn't find it anywhere. And uh, we brought it up in an early episode, and some guy told me the entire story about it and how it was solicited by this company, and the company went out of business before it was ever produced. And there's a little bit more drama behind it, but I won't, I won't bring that up now. But it never existed except for as like a listing. So, you know, rumors of it existed, but the real comic was never produced, and I got an answer for that, so. That's always been wild, too, whenever we do like our quarter bin dives. That's a deep and dive. And show, and show these things that we got for a quarter, super obscure, sometimes regionally based weirdo comics that probably never made it out of the hometown of the cartoonist. And then those cartoonists like pop up in the chat and like are in the comments like, oh my god, like 
You're, you're where, Pittsburgh? That's very I fun. Didn't, I didn't think that any copies of this escaped Michigan. <laughs> Do you ever think about how those 80s black and white self-published books are basically the, the preceding books to an event like SPX? Like they're the forefathers of SPX, that self-publishing, you know, making them, you know, I always look at where those books come from and they come from everywhere like Iowa and Wyoming and Utah and you know, like it's just somebody, there's a print shop in town, they wanna make right. a comic and here it goes. It's really the same, the same philosophy, the same drive, the same kind of creativity as what we celebrate here at SPX, it just happened you know, 10 years before SPX starts going. Right. Yeah. I had somebody mention this morning about how Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles would have been the start of this kind of stuff. I'm not sure I totally agree, but it definitely inspired a generation to do, you know, make your own comics, produce them yourself, create your own characters and all of that. What do you think, Jimmy? We have like close to 10, 10 minutes, 12 minutes. We maybe do a little Q&A before we get out of here? Yeah, man, let's do it. There's a microphone right there. Uh, if you guys have any questions, go to the mic. Maybe. And we can uh, address any of that stuff, man. But uh, where are you saying, oh, you know what? I, I, have, I have a favor to ask if, um, if you guys would be so kind uh, whenever we get out of here, because I kind of think a prank is being played on me at the Fanographics table. <laughs> this I'm is gonna, great. Because I'm doing a signing uh, after this panel, 2.30, and I took a look at the list of like, all, who all is doing signings and stuff, and everybody's teamed up. I mean, Hernandez is teamed up with Katie Skelly. And That's I'm a the, pretty good team. It's a great team. But like, I'm the only person signing at 2.30, and I feel like I just don't want crickets. <laughs> <laughs> so even if you guys just roll up, do me that favor. If you like the channel, just, just Pop up, like, let's make a super giant line and just come up and say hi to me. And let's, and let's just show them that, that, that uh, you know, like, it's like a reverse, uh, a reversal, you know, a heel turn. Yes. Uh, we're playing a trick on the people playing the trick on me. I like it. If you guys would do that, I'd be so, so grateful. Because if, because if it is crickets, I might not be able to show my face here again. Uh oh. Next year. Uh oh. <laughs> yes. going wild. Does that make sense? Um, I've done stuff that's kind of outside panels. Um, I think some of my Street Angel comics, I've played around with different panel stuff. Like I did a book called Street Angel Goes to Juvie. So she's incarcerated for the first half of the story or so. And every scene is, a, is based on a different grid to sort of like, uh, you know, try to capture a sense of her being trapped in prison, you know, stuck in this routine. And then whenever she inevitably escapes, she is the greatest ninja in comics history, so no prison's gonna hold her for long, no longer than she once held. So once she escapes, um, I went from having like, I would make up grids on the paper in like light blue so that I could very quickly see like all the different permutations I was using. Whenever she escaped, I went to totally white paper with no guidelines at all. So whenever I was drawing, it was just very free. It was one of my favorite experiences making comics ever. So I do think about panels and, and you know, sort of like use every part of the, uh, you know, every part of the comic. Like I thought of that whenever Ed's describing um, Ben Mara's biographies, like every piece of that comic can be a part of the storytelling, including, you know, panels, panel border structure, whatever. And recently we, we've done some dives into like Todd McFarlane's um, spawn issues, the early spawn issues. And the one thing that I took away is his page layouts and panel layouts. They're, they're very far removed from a grid and it's pretty interesting. And I kind of started there and then went towards a grid. And so now seeing these guys who never really seem to use a grid, I find pretty interesting and, and will probably be a direction I explore more. Yeah, sort of the same thing. I have used the grid on the past seven books or eight books that I've done and feel pretty comfortable with the storytelling uh, of, of that. And the thing about McFarland, the thing about Sam Keith and Jamie Hewlett to some extent, th these are three artists I'm looking at a lot right now with, with some fresh eyes. They do have very fun uh, page layouts, but the storytelling is lacking. And like my experiment now is to see if you can have wild page layouts, but still keep the storytelling paramount to the project, to the, to the whole idea and that's where I'm at right now. You looking at those artists and, and playing around with those panel borders and all that, so it's been pretty fun. I guess probably one last question. Sure. Um, 
So over your years of coming to SBX, what would you say has been the representation of outlaw creators, outlaw comics? And as SBX you know, increases in popularity, do you think it's more likely that we'll see more of that style or, or less over the years? Oh, man. I, I can remember uh, like one outlaw style comic I discovered here within the last year or two was Alex Delaney, who does um, a couple of books, one called Derelict, one called The Wrong Side of Town. I think that's the name of it. Um, but it's totally outlaw. And, and you know, it's in the tradition of, of SPX, of self-publishing. You know, they were black and white comics whenever I first discovered them and just set up, you know, next to somebody doing risograph, very art, arty comics. So I don't know. I think it just depends on people's taste that, that get accepted to the show. But I don't think that stuff will go away. It might be a matter of, like, digging around and finding those comics here that you're excited by that, that fit the outlaw mold if that's what you're after. But I, I'm pretty confident there are a few upstairs right now. I'm not uh, that confident there, that there are uh, many upstairs. They, like, it's, a, it's a pretty kind of like um, cheerful kind of vibe that most of the people upstairs have. And in fact, just thinking about whenever I first came to the show for the first time in 2004, uh, I almost never left Pittsburgh in my life. You know, it's like a year or two after, after high school. So I never even saw like, hipster shit before and I never and, and like I'm walking by dudes with like the Pringles can mustache and I'm walking by dudes who are wearing glasses with no lenses at SPX cosplay <laughs> and I was like what is this shit like like it freaked me out it made me nervous I was scared like Bethesda's close enough to Pittsburgh that I was like man I hope nobody back home sees me around some of these moments because like, <laughs> like I don't want them to confuse me with them man a lot of like soft hearted shit and uh I think that's escalated. Like, so good, good, good luck with the uh, good luck with finding outlaw comics here. But you'll find them online. And I'm waiting for your next one to come out. One okay, one place to look for outlaw comics at the Fanographics tables. If there's any Ben Mara still in print there, most of that stuff I would call outlaw comics. Yeah, come to the Fanographics table at 2:30 when I do my signing, <laughs> and we got to get the heck out of here now. But before we do. Enough of you guys raised your freaking hands and said that you knew what was up with the channel. So I'm going to need you to give me those marching orders on the count of three. One, two, three. Read more comics. One more time. That was weak. One, two, three. Read more comics. That's better. Thank you.